Hi, I'm Justin Rosso, and I'm here with my good friend Conrad Gumpf from the London School of Theology. And I invite him along for our devotion today because we follow Jesus better when we follow him together. Conrad, thanks for joining me in my uh, my virtual Zoom fireside chat room. <laughs> We're actually several thousand miles apart, but <laughs> that's right. Here we are with a frozen fire. Yeah, exactly. Well, appropriate for the, the weather, a frozen fire. Hey, uh, today we're looking at Jesus as the son of Solomon, and we're going to talk about what that might mean in the Bible and what that might mean for us today. Uh, son of Solomon doesn't seem to me, I don't remember that as a prophetic uh, title. I don't remember it as, it's not like son of David or Messiah or something like that. Is there anything I'm missing, or is there a son of Solomon that people would have been expecting in the first century? No, I think you're right. Um, I think you're right. I think it's an unusual title. Um, but of course, he is descended from Solomon. So Yeah. Yeah. And enough. we get that. So we get that in Matthew chapter one, uh, the genealogy, the, the story of Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And of course, in that genealogy, you get Solomon in there as well. Uh, let's just talk about Solomon a little bit. If I were a, kind of a typical first century person walking around the hill country of Judea in zero AD, uh, what, what might I have known or expected or thought about Solomon, do you think? I think there are three things that come to mind. The first one we don't usually bring to mind, but they might have in the first century, and that was the size of Solomon's empire. Hmm. But Solomon didn't go out and grab the empire. David did. So son of David might include that more than Solomon, but maybe we'll come back to the size of the empire. I think that's one of the things that comes up. The other thing that comes up for us that I'm not sure came up with them was the wisdom of Solomon. Hmm. And we we tend to love that story about carving the baby in half. Oh, and, right, right, and, right. And so on. Um, but I think I'm guessing from the Gospels, that the most prominent thing about Solomon for the first century Jews would be his wealth and splendor and opulence. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason that I say that is because when when Jesus is talking about the, the flowers in the field, it's not even Solomon in all his splendor was arrayed as one of these. Yeah. He must be playing on ordinary perceptions in his audience by comparing the flowers to Solomon. So I think that probably is what a first century person would think. But hmm. now, now, one of the things that I thought of others. Well, well, uh, and, and maybe it goes along with the the grandeur, but it would be the the temple itself. So Solomon's temple, which of course by at this point had been destroyed, but but that Her Herod is rebuilding now a magnificent temple. Uh, even Jesus' disciples would say, "Look at this magnificent! You know, look at the stones." And 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 Jesus has some words about that glory too but the temple would be another one for me connected to solomon you think uh first century jews might have thought of that too they may have but by this time the temple gets very confused so there's ezekiel's promised temple about the future of mm -hmm. the future mm -hmm. um the temple that they're living with is the one post destruction of solomon's temple so yeah, it's yeah. sort of ezra nehemiah temple you know but but as you say, Herod has been uh, involved in this grand rebuilding mm. process for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so in Matthew, temple... Matthew 1, we get uh, Jesus as son of David, son of Abraham. Also, Solomon is in that lineage. It's in Matthew 12, and it's in the back half of Matthew 12. There's this really interesting interaction between Jesus and some Pharisees. They've come to Jesus looking for a sign. And Jesus says, no, I'm not going to give you a sign except for the sign of Jonah, which, which I think we think has to do with being in the tomb for three days. Uh, like jo Jonah was in the, the belly of the fish for three days. Maybe there's more to that. And then he goes on to, to say that the, even people who like uh, the queen from the south, now we know from Solomon's time, the queen of Sheba does come to visit Solomon because of his renown, because of his grandeur and splendor, because of the size of empire, also because of his wisdom. He's famous for that. Uh, she's going to condemn these people because she came all that way to listen to Solomon and his wisdom, and they're not listening to him. Something Jesus reversed himself as something greater than Solomon. Something greater than Solomon is here, and you're not listening. So how does that play into our understanding 
that seems to be closer to wisdom than empire, probably not temple in that case. What do you think? Well, you've just made me think of something else hmm. because Jonah and the Queen of Sheba and, and therefore Solomon are linked in another way that you might not have thought of, and that's preaching to the Gentiles, yeah. impressing the Gentiles, going out to the Gentiles, which we know that is something that the Jews of Jesus' day were upset with him about. He didn't do a lot of preaching to the Gentiles, but uh, at the Nazareth sermon, famously, you know, he says that he's not come to help just the people of Israel, but is coming to help Gentiles just as Elijah and mm -hmm. just as so on. Mm -hmm. So both Jonah and Solomon are folks who have this ministry, this 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 ability to impress the Gentiles, which is something the Jews in the first century were were looking for. Mm. They sort of wanted to beat Rome up, but they also wanted Rome to acknowledge the greatness of the Lord and, mm. and the Lord's laws. Uh, and and Jesus may have been using those characters to refer to that part of his mission. Okay. So Jesus has uh, this authoritative word that he's bringing, and, and he's uh, kind of at loggerheads with these Pharisees because they're not actually listening to this word, that if the Queen of Sheba were there, she would listen. Shoot, if the Ninevites, the, the capital of the enemy Assyrian Empire, if the Ninevites can repent, then, then so could you, but you're choosing not to listen. So that maybe that's in there somewhere. Um, uh, and maybe I'm just thinking this because I'm teaching Romans right now to my students. And of course, Romans in Romans 9 to 11, one of the things that Paul expects about the whole Jesus thing is that the Jews will see how it's influencing the Gentiles and how all people right. are all over the world are flocking to the gospel because of Jesus, uh, flocking to, to God because of Jesus. Right. And that will make the Jews jealous because that's what they want to have happen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's kind of upside down. They're, they're, from what I understand it, their kind of outreach paradigm would have been make other people jealous because our laws and our lives are so good. And now Paul's turning that on its head and saying, uh, the Jews are going to be jealous because people are coming to, to the true God because of Jesus. And they'll want some of that too. That's, that's really yeah. interesting. Uh, let me back up just a couple of verses because it's earlier. In fact, I think you might I think in Matthew 12, it would be one reason why these Pharisees are asking Jesus for an authoritative sign, because earlier in the chapter, at the beginning of chapter 12, Jesus ha is talking about Sabbath, and, and at, he says some of the confusing things about Sabbath laws, and uh, he th there will say uh, something greater than the temple is here. So he's getting after the Pharisees for these religious laws, not understanding that Jesus Jesus is saying he himself is greater than Solomon's temple, uh, which to me is still a little confusing, especially if we're trying to, we want to bridge this to what it means for me today to think of Jesus as, as a son of Solomon, and a, certainly authoritative word, but now Jesus is greater than the temple. Is Jesus telling me I should like cast off religious stereotypes or I shouldn't follow religious rules or I should stop going to church on Sunday? Or I mean, what, what's this greater than the Sabbath, greater than the temple thing? Well, I think, I don't think you believe any of that about church. Well, no, um, no, but you know, when you're reading it, it starts to make you wonder, like, well, how am I supposed to apply that? Well, the, the temple and the tabernacle will have been the place in Jewish tradition where people were used to meeting with God and mm. and, and and sort of announcing and signifying God's presence Uh is the temple and now there's another way of signifying god's presence and that's jesus and through the spirit i, I remember i once I, sorry i'm going to take a little story here <laughs> i i once was asked to um to consult on a tv program that was going to be about it's going to dramatize the whole bible and some of the people i w was working with had no idea about what the bible was or what was in it so I remember the director saying that it was important that we establish a character that's going to be present and visible through all 10 episodes or whatever it was. So he asked, so who would that be, Moses, or was he dead by the time that, that Paul was writing? <laughs> and of course it wasn't. So the, the only presence, of course, is, 
is God, but we're not allowed to picture him. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> finally we settled that throughout the Old Testament, the presence of God would be the temple. We would use the temple or the tabernacle or whatever there was as this character. Mm -hmm. And we decided that the closing shot of every episode would be the temple uh, or the tabernacle. So the first episode would take us from Adam to, you know, Moses and the Exodus, yeah. and that would be then the tabernacle. tabernacle. The next episode would be, you know, maybe Solomon's temple and mm -hmm. so on, the rebuilt mm -hmm. temple of Ezra and Nehemiah, and then Herod restoring the temple in the time of Jesus. But then at Pentecost, the stuff is happening on the street a few blocks away, and we see the temple in the background, and yeah, yeah, with Jesus it, and with the Holy Spirit, something greater than the temple has come. And oh, yeah, that's beautiful. It reminds me of Paul in in Ephesians two, I think it is, where he talks about both these Jews and Gentiles being built together as a as a building, a temple, a dwelling of living stones that's inhabited by God. In the presence of the spirit with Jesus right there at the center. So you get this image of the people of God being the new temple, the new tabernacle, the place where God dwells for the sake of the world, which I guess gets us back to Solomon and that empire that extended beyond any other empire in the history of the people of God in Israel uh, gets back it's to Solomon's wife. Uh, go ahead. During the intertestamental period, the Maccabees actually ah, right. got built an empire that was about the size of Solomon's empire. You can squabble about which one was bigger, They, but they were very comparable. And of course, that may have been in the minds of the Jews mm. in the first century as well. Mm. So when they hear Solomon or David, they'll be thinking about the restoration of the kingdom, the mm. way that the way that David got mm -hmm. the kingdom together and Solomon ruled over it. So then in Jesus, the son of Solomon, we have someone who is restoring the kingdom uh, the way God intended it, uh, who reigns over the whole earth and yet is also bringing a restoration to the earth, a, a new creation that's not something different, but being made new, not something entirely uh, separate, but something restored. You get Jesus, who is the authoritative, who has the word that goes out even to uh, people who were God's enemies, that calls people to repentance, that gathers people in a word of authority that you're called to listen to. And then you also get this, this image of, of Jesus as one who uh, not only reigns as king, but who restores a relationship with God where God dwells in Jesus. And because Jesus dwells in the midst of God's people, God's people become a, a temple, something even greater than Solomon's temple where God lives by his and, spirit. And uh, the depth of wisdom Mm. that we think of with Solomon. And I'm happy to add a new kind of treasure and riches mm. that we will have with him eventually. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks. That's, that's a really helpful way to think about Jesus and Solomon and how they might connect to our real day. Let's close with prayer. And, and thanks for, for chiming in all the way from across the pond. Uh, I'll be rooting for the USA in the World Cup, but I'll also be rooting for England so, so we can kind of do that together. Thank you. Let's pray. Uh, King Jesus, son of David, son of Abraham, son of Solomon, please reign again in our hearts today. We look forward to your, your everlasting reign, this reign that extends God's kingdom uh, across the world and into the new creation as you restore all things. Bring that kingdom already now ahead of time uh, as you bring your authoritative word as the splendor of God's presence is evident in our lives by faith, as you set up shop also in your people, dwelling in us by your spirit, will you please let your word shine in us that the nations might come to know you. Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Conrad. We'll see you next time. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.